You can tell a lot about a rock just by examining the grains that make it up. For example, in this rock here, the large size, the gravel size of the grains, as well as the fact that they're so rounded, tells me that this was a high energy environment where the grains rolled around a lot before they were finally deposited. And so it's perfectly plausible to think that a river channel or a beach might have been where this sediment was deposited. On the other hand, if I'm confronted with a rock like this, it's a bit more of a mystery. Sure, it's sand, but what kind of sandy environment? Was it a beach, a sand dune, a river channel? It could have been any one of those things. Now, if I'm confronted by an environment like this in the modern world, I've got additional lines of evidence that I can draw upon. For example, I've got seaweed here. I've got a bird trackway over here. And of course, the most obvious feature is all of these ripple marks right here. So even if I could not see, if I cropped out of the photograph, all of this water here, I could still say quite confidently that this is a beach environment I'm looking at. Now, when I look at the rock record, luckily, all of these features are capable of being preserved. So, for example, I may find a rock like this. Sure, I've got, you know, a fine-grained sand or a silt, which is telling me something about the environment, but far more important is the presence of these ripples here, which are telling me exactly the same story as the ripples did in the present. The most simplest kind of structure that uh, is preserved is simply bedding like this. When layers of rocks are laid down, they're of course laid down sequentially with the oldest on the bottom and the youngest on top. If there are subtle changes in the type of environment or the type of sediment coming in, those are reflected in subtle changes in the color and perhaps the grain size of the sediments themselves, forming unique and distinguishable beds of rock. Now these beds would have originally been horizontal, but they've been flipped up on their side just slightly by tectonic forces. A little bit more complicated is what you actually get within a ripple, or on a larger case, a sand dune. As individual grains of sand move along like this, they tend to accumulate in the pressure shadow in the front of the ripple or in the front of the dune. So as a result, they build up here till they become oversteepened and then collapse, leaving behind a slip surface along which they slide. So the result is that over time, the rock itself ends up with these characteristic curved features that we call cross beds within them. Those cross beds tell us not only that this was originally the deposit of a ripple or a sand dune, but they even tell you the direction that the wind or water was flowing. The bottom, the foot of the cross bed is always going to point in the direction of flow. Now in this case, you can see that they have an asymmetrical shape. They're shaped differently on one side than the other. They're steeper on the side of the movement. On the other hand, if the direction was changing back and forth, the result is going to be one which is equal on both sides, or symmetrical. And so even the shape of the ripple itself is going to tell you something about the environment where they were deposited. Now in this case here, we can see we've got cross beds, and we know that the current direction had to have been this direction because the foot is pointing in the direction of flow. On the other hand, if you look at this tree right here, you know the scale of this is on the order of meters. And the only way you can build a ripple, the scale of meters, is with wind. These are sand dunes. And if we've got sand dunes, that means we're in a desert environment. Because that's the only environment where water and plants aren't holding the grains of sand down and allow them to move along like this. Now here is an example of a slightly more complicated kind of ripple. Here you can see that you've got these kind of symmetrical ripples of sand here, but they're laid over top by layers of fine-grained mud. This is the kind of thing that forms in a tidal environment, where when the tide comes in with its strong energy, it forms ripples, and then at slack tide or at high tide, it's going to drop down any mud that it's holding in suspension. That mud will sit on top of the ripple, and then when the tide goes out, that process reverses itself. And so you get alternating sequences of sand, mud, and sand. These are called flazer beds. Here's another example of a structure you see internal to a rock. So here you can see you've got larger grains on the top than you do in the bottom. We call this graded bedding. And this happens either when you have a slowing current or when you dump a bunch of material, like in an underwater landslide. So in this case, we can tell that the way up is this way. And it also tells you something characteristic about the environment. Most often these occur off the coast when we build up enough sediment that eventually flows off in a thing called a turbidity flow. Here's another example of a flow indicator. In this case, all of these grains have responded to this directionality of flow by sitting up on their ends like this. This is called imbrication. And here's an example of imbrication in reality. So this is a rock. Can you tell which way water was flowing? 
Well, you should be able to tell it was this direction right here based on the orientation of the grains. Here's something you've probably seen anytime you've seen uh, a summer day after a, a serious rain shower. So the mud puddles form and the mud puddles evaporate away. So they form cracks just like this. And these cracks can get preserved into the rock record. In fact, they're very common in Cape Breton and all over Nova Scotia. So this is telling you a couple of things. One is this used to be something like a shallow water lake. But the second thing it's telling you is the environment this is being deposited in tends to flip into very arid conditions, only periodically inundated with water. So this is, again, telling you are, you are in a deserty environment. You can't get a more classic deserty environment indicator than this one right here. What could these little divots be? These are individual impressions formed by raindrops themselves. And the only way you can preserve raindrops like this is if you alternate between periodic showers of rain, inundating and indenting into the mud, and then it's got to dry out to preserve them into that hardened clay. Here's another example, except these ones were formed by organisms. This is a thing called diplogonites, and this is formed by a giant extinct millipede. So where do millipedes live? Well, they have to live on land. And so this trackway itself is telling you something about uh, where this environment had to have been formed. Over here, we can see small toes. One, two, three, four little toes over here. Uh, maybe there's a fifth toe. I think there's just four toes. One, two, three, four, perhaps a five. This is the trail of an amphibian. So again, this is telling you something about the environment, probably wetter than this environment over here, but certainly not an undersea environment. This isn't a marine environment because there are no organisms that walk around on the bottom of the ocean. In fact, we have an entire science that we call ichnology. Ichnology is the study of trace fossils or the traces of behavior left behind by organisms. And we can tell not only whether something was marine, freshwater, or on land, but in fact, we can even tell the depth of the water by looking at the particular assemblage of trace fossils. In shallow water environments where a lot of energy tends to disturb things, the traces tend to be very simple and vertical. On the other hand, in deeper water environments, we get these incredibly complicated geometrical shapes showing up. Here's another environment, another example of getting environment from fossils. But these aren't trace fossils, these are body fossils. These ones may not look super familiar, but if you look a little bit, you should be able to tell these are leaves. This is a thing called annularia. And where do you find leaves preserved? Well, it's possible this leaf got washed out to the ocean, but far more likely this was preserved in a flood uh, zone or perhaps in a lake. On the other hand, this and hmm, that did not work. That was supposed to show you a fossil of a thing called a crinoid. And a crinoid has a stalk with a series of tentacle-like branches that come off. These are relatives of starfish. And where do they live? Well, they live in the ocean. And so if I was to find a bunch of crinoids, even if the rock itself looked very similar, I would know that I have to be in a marine environment. Here's the final example I want to show you. And this is a, one that's a little tiny bit confusing. So what you're looking at right here is the example of something which is called a soul mark. And specifically, this is a thing called a flute cast. So what you're looking at is not actually the surface of the rock. It's the underside of the overlying rock. So these are erosional structures that form as water moves along, eroding away sediment that used to be there and carrying it away, leaving an indentation behind, which is then filled in by an additional influx of sediment. And so if you were to remove this whole piece, if you were to separate these two layers, what you would see is on the underside of this layer right here, you would see a cast of what used to be a hole. And in fact, that's what you're looking at here. So we can use these to figure out not only the direction of flow. If you look right here, you know the direction of flow had to be that way. Also something about the environment. These tend to form in offshore environments associated with underwater landslides. But they also tell you about, once again, which way is up. In this case, we know that that way is up. Therefore, I am looking at the bottom of a bed. So these are a few examples of how we can use things like fossils and sedimentary structures to gain additional information about an environment. In the next part of the exercise, you're going to be applying these to make some inferences yourself.